And as you take your seats, would you open up with me in the scriptures to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we are going to be considering and studying the first seven verses of Ecclesiastes 5. So up to this point, uh, as we've walked through the book of Ecclesiastes, we've been following Solomon as he has essentially uh, looked out at the world from his perspective, and he's observed how things work in the world under the sun, and he has essentially seen how Everyone is pursuing meaning and permanence and significance and value in something. Whether that be in his own life or in the life of others, everyone is pursuing all of these different things in the world in the hopes that they might provide a sense of permanence, meaning, weight to life. Some people have sought that in pleasure. Other people have sought it in things like work, or in money, or in power, or in popularity. Uh, And the list goes on. Throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, we've seen all of these different pursuits, and all of them have come up empty. Uh, They have not been able to make life permanent and give it any significant weight of lasting value. And this evening, Solomon turns his eyes, in a sense, away from the world out there, and into the world in here, in the church. Uh, He is now no longer looking at what people are doing out there in the world. He's now looking at how people worship. And he says, even here, even in the house of God, he, he will go on to say, there is a way to worship that leads to emptiness, or that is characterized by emptiness, or vanity, or vapor. Of course, we know from the book of Solomon that Life is not meaningless. It is meaningless if we seek meaning ultimately in this world, but it's not meaningless when we remember that even this brief life is a gift from God. He has given us this brief life for us to enjoy and for us to bring glory to Him. And when we view life from the right perspective, we see its value. And in the same way, when we see worship, when we approach worship from the right perspective, with the right heart, it's not meaningless. It's not empty. But we, when we approach it with the wrong heart, then even something like worship becomes vanity, becomes meaningless. Uh, so let's look at verses 1 to 7, where Solomon describes the potential of meaningless, empty worship. Beginning in verse 1, guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, Do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams... And in many words, there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Amen. This is God's holy and inerrant word. Look again at verse 7. For in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. That word emptiness is the word that has come up again and again in the book of Ecclesiastes. And will come up again and again as we continue our way through Ecclesiastes. The word emptiness is the same word that's translated vanity. Uh, Repeatedly in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're told that such and such a pursuit is vanity. And here, again, Solomon is saying, even in worship, there is emptiness. There is vanity. And so what's the solution to empty worship? If there is a way for worship to be empty or vain 
then what's the response that we ought to have? Well, he provides it for us in the second half of verse 7. Therefore, fear God. The way that we prevent and avoid meaningless worship is to worship in the fear of God. To put it another way, our worship becomes nothing more than meaningless mechanics when we forget the God that we're drawing near to. When we don't consider that he is completely other than us, that he's not like us, he is completely distinct, infinitely separate, and infinitely holy. The way that we avoid meaningless worship is to worship in the fear of God. So if I were to give a specific topic for tonight's sermon, then it would be just that, fear God in worship, or worship in the fear of God. Fear God in your worship. Give real, significant thought to what is taking place every time you approach your Creator in prayer or in the reading of His Word, and especially in the context of corporate worship. When we come together as a church to worship our God in the context of public worship, we ought to do so in the fear of God, giving real thought to what's taking place when we gather to worship our Creator. So that raises the initial question then, what is the fear of God? We have all these sayings in Christianity that we use often and assume meaning and don't necessarily know what we're talking about and what we mean by those phrases. Uh, so we might say, I'm really trying to walk in the Spirit. And someone says, well, what do you mean by walk in the Spirit? I don't know. I read it in Galatians 5. And we read things like the fear of the Lord. And someone says, well, what do you mean by the fear of the Lord? I don't know. I just read it in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, let's start by saying what it doesn't mean at least not the biblical fear of the Lord. The biblical fear of the Lord is not merely being afraid of the Lord. Uh, it's not merely being, uh, having a sense of dread or terror in the presence of the Lord. Sinful fear or carnal fear is the kind of fear that makes us merely afraid of God. Sinful fear is what causes someone to tremble, be fearful of the wrath of God, but not to the point of coming to him as Savior. Uh, sinful fear causes us to fear God's punishment, but not to the point of actually forsaking sin and repenting and believing. So sinful fear is the kind of fear, if you picture Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, in Genesis 3, after they've eaten from the forbidden tree, they're full of shame and they're full of guilt. And where does God find them? He finds them hiding in their shame out of fear. They were afraid, they said, because they knew that they were naked. They were full of shame because of their sin, but instead of taking their shame to God, they took their shame and they ran from God. That's sinful fear. It's the kind of fear that the demons have in James 2 when they tremble at the majesty and holiness of God, but not with any measure of repentance. It's the kind of fear that any unbeliever has. Most people, at least somewhere in their soul, have some measure of the fear of God in the sense that they're afraid of Him. They know that God can and will punish sin, but they choose to distance themselves from Him, or at least attempt to distance themselves from Him, rather than to run to Him. That's not the kind of fear that Solomon tells us should characterize our worship. Not a fear that makes us tremble in being afraid of God. He isn't telling us that we need to run from God, certainly not that we need to hide from God, but he's talking about the proper and healthy acknowledgement when we draw near to God that God is not like us. He's not like you. As much as we like to think of God in these nice, neat categories that we can fit into boxes of our own thinking, we need to acknowledge God is not like us in any way. He is infinitely above us and transcendent beyond anything we could ever fully comprehend. 
In fact, that's the point that Solomon makes in this passage. So if you look down at verse 2, he says, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. And then here he gives the reason. For God is in heaven, and you are on the earth. Here's why you ought to fear God. Because God is in heaven, and you are in the earth. Jesus, in his teaching on how we ought to pray, he begins the prayer famously with the words, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father reminds us we are coming to a God who loves us and cares about us. He is our Father. But at the same time, in heaven reminds us that we're coming to a God who is not like us. He's infinitely above us. And that's what characterizes all true godly fear. A healthy, reverent approach to God begins with confidence, first of all, that He is our Father, but then the acknowledgement that He is not a God that is like us. Now, when, when Solomon says God is in heaven, when Jesus says our Father who is in heaven, what, what does he mean by that? What, what is the main emphasis being communicated when they say God is in heaven and Solomon, you are on the earth? Obviously, it means more than spatial uh, location. He's not talking about geography. He's not saying God's sphere of existence is heaven. That's where he's confined to. And your existence is on the earth, and that's where you're confined to. We could go to Psalm 139 and see God is everywhere, all the time, fully. He is here in this room with us in the fullness of his being. He is in all of his creation, at all times, in all of himself. And so the, dis- the distinction here is not God is up there and you are down here geographically or locally. The distinction isn't spatial at all. It's ontological. He's making a distinction of being. You are on earth, meaning you're a creature. God is in heaven, meaning he is creator. And there is an infinite gulf between creator and creature. He is eternal. You are temporal. He's infinite. You are are, uh, finite, bound by time and space in your existence. He's immutable. He never changes. You are constantly changing. You are creature. He's holy. You are sinful. And the list could go on. So the point is, God being in heaven refers to God being creator. You being on earth refers to you being creature. And the realization of the absolute distinction between you and God should create in your heart some measure of fear, of an acknowledgement, this is no trivial thing. This is not something to be taken lightly. To approach our Creator and speak to Him and listen to Him is not something that we should do carelessly. And that will be the point that Solomon goes on to make. And so the fear of the Lord begins with the humble acknowledgement, God is not like us, He is in heaven, we are on earth, but this acknowledgement does not drive us away from Him, it drives us to Him. A right fear of the Lord. You you know that you have a right fear of the Lord when it compels you to go no other place than closer to Him. You know that you have a sinful fear of the Lord when your response is to distance yourself from Him. Uh, I like the way Michael Reeves puts it in his book, Rejoice and Tremble on the Fear of the Lord. He says, It is the devil's work to promote a fear of God that makes people afraid of God. Let Let me say that again. It is the devil's work to promote a fear of God that makes people afraid of God such that they want to flee from God. That's the devil's work. The Spirit's work is the exact opposite, to produce in us a wonderful fear that wins and draws us to God. If it is a Spirit-wrought fear of the Lord, then it wins your heart to the Lord. It draws you to Him. It is a force so strong that you can't resist it. You realize this God is so good and so magnificent and so gracious and so full of love and holiness that I could never turn my back on him. That's what it is to fear him. And so what Solomon is saying then in these first seven verses is that worship, proper worship, begins with a fear of God, a holy fear of God. At the heart of all true worship 
is that sort of fear. But then what he does in these first seven verses is he shows at least two major errors in our worship that demonstrate a lack of fear of God. And so in other words, if you were to ask, how do I know that I am approaching God without the fear of God? What is a good test or examination of my own heart to see whether I am approaching him in fear? And he provides two different ways that we can tell. The first is in verses 1 to 3. We know that we're lacking the fear of God when we are quick to speak and slow to listen. We lack the fear of God when we draw near and are quick to speak and slow to listen. Look again at verses 1 to 3. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Let's actually stop there for now. The house of God obviously refers to the temple in Jerusalem, the temple that Solomon himself built. And we were reminded Sunday from Anthony's sermon that obviously we don't go to the temple any longer for worship. The temple has come to an end. It was the place of worship, but now that Christ has come, he has fulfilled everything the temple signified. True worship takes place in spirit and in truth in the name of the Son of God. So we don't go to a temple any longer to worship, Uh, But what Solomon is saying here about worship in the temple certainly applies to the Christian today. Uh, We still worship. We just worship everywhere. We, We worship as a way of life, and that worship finds special focus when we come together for corporate worship. And so the principles of worship apply to our own lives, both in our personal worship and in our corporate worship. And he says that the right way to draw near to God in worship is, first of all, to guard your steps. To guard your steps. And so if you picture the temple and you imagine someone walking the steps to the temple, the idea here is literally, as that person walks up those steps, he's doing so thoughtfully, carefully. Figuratively, the application would be, make sure that your walk up those steps matches your walk in life. Make sure that there's not some massive inconsistency between the way you approach the temple and the way you live the rest of your life. And so the application in that sense would be make sure that when you worship God, you're not pretending to be something here that you're not before you get here and after you leave here. Guard your steps. The other emphasis there would be prepare your heart. Come with thoughtfulness. Recognize what it is that's about to take place as you draw near to God. And you do that especially when you come to listen. Uh, So you guard your steps, you come with a prepared heart when you come to listen to God. I'm sure you've been in a conversation before with someone, and as you're talking to them, uh, maybe in in a public setting or in a coffee shop or something, as you're talking with them, the whole time their eyes are in other parts of the room, Uh, they're they're pulling out their phone and looking at it, they're maybe giving a, "Uh uh-huh, yep. Uh Uh-huh, looking away, and it's clear they're distracted with all sorts of other things. And when they do that, what are they communicating to you? They're saying, I don't really care that much what you have to say. I have more important things to do with my time and my attention and my listening capacity than listen to you and what you have to say. When we approach God that way, we're communicating the very same thing to him. Your words are not worth my time. I have more important things to think about. I have more important things going on in my life right now that take precedent over your word and the importance of it. And so when we come to him with a thoughtless attitude and a careless mind and with no real interest in listening to what he has to say, Solomon says what we're doing in that moment is offering the sacrifice of a fool. We're proving that our heart is foolish because we're demonstrating that there's no fear of God in our hearts in that moment. We are treating God as if he is some insignificant voice that we can choose either to listen to or disregard. And so Solomon goes on then in verses 2 and 3, and he says, Don't be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, 
For God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. That last verse there is tricky, verse 3. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. The second part's clear enough. The voice of a fool comes through many words. In other words, if you come speaking a whole bunch of things without giving any thought to it, you're going to demonstrate your foolishness, is the point of the second half of the verse. For the dream comes through much effort. That's a little bit trickier to translate and to understand. But it seems like the idea, the emphasis that Solomon is making there, is that we we shouldn't come with our own fanciful thoughts and imaginations of our own mind when we come to God. The goal of worship is not to come with our own imaginations, our own dreams, our own fanciful thoughts to present to him. That's not the purpose of worship. Instead, we come to receive from him and to respond to him. And so what Solomon seems to be saying is rather than thinking and responding to God's word, the fool, the sacrifice of a fool is the person who comes with their mind busy with all these other things that they think are more important. Uh, It's the one who comes with all these things they want to say, but they have no intention of listening and learning, submitting their heart to the God who speaks. And so the lack of the fear of the Lord causes us to speak carelessly and quickly and to not listen slowly and thoroughly to the things that God has to say. So the application then would be Don't be foolish, this first section. Don't be foolish by approaching God with a busy mind, lots of thoughtless and careless words. Instead, let your words be few and let them be thoughtful. So how does this apply then in your life as a Christian? Let your words be few, he says. Does that mean that in the morning, as you take time to pray and devote a number of minutes to the Lord of uninterrupted prayer time, does that mean that once you reach three or four words, you've got to call it quits? Uh, because at that point, you've surpassed the limit of what's allowed, according to Solomon. Certainly not. Jesus spent all night in prayer. Uh, he spoke 650 words, according to one Google search, in the upper room, in the high priestly prayer. Uh, he rebuked his disciples for spending Uh, for not being able to spend an hour of of prayer with him. And so the point here is not that our prayer time should be no longer than three or four words. But the point is that when we speak to God, we shouldn't speak more than we mean. We shouldn't say more than we actually mean. It's far better to speak a few words of significance in the presence of the Lord and in humility and in sincerity than to speak a whole bunch of hurried and thoughtless words. Better are a few sincere words than many empty words, we might say. All right, so to pull it all back then and get the, the kind of the flow of the argument, Solomon is saying that a lack of the fear of God is seen in a careless approach to worship. And the first way that we see that manifested in worship is that we come to God with all of our own thoughts, all of our own ideas, rather than with a heart that is ready to listen and submit itself to whatever it is God speaks to us from his word. And when we do that, we are offering the sacrifice of fools. But then next, Solomon moves on. Not only should we not be quick to speak and slow to listen, but we also should not make insincere commitments. Verses 4 to 7, insincere commitments or vows. Look at those verses with me. Verse 4, when you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Solomon is making a similar point to the first three verses with regard to careless speech. Uh, It has to do here again with being insincere in the things that we we say to God. But now the emphasis is turned directly toward the vows that we might make to the Lord, the commitments that we might make to him. 
It was especially common in the Old Testament. We read about these sorts of things, especially in the Pentateuch, uh, that people would make vows to the Lord and go above and beyond the basic requirement and offer something additional to God as an expression of their devotion and consecration. It would basically be their way of saying, Lord, I'm really serious about this. I I want you to know I am serious about whatever it is I'm committing to do. And Solomon's point here is that we must be faithful to carry out what we promise to do. If we're going to say that we're going to do something, we should do it, essentially, is the main point here. You may remember, if you were here last year, we had a whole section in the London Baptist Confession that we went through on oaths and vows. Uh, I'm not able to get into everything that we talked about in the hour that we spent on that, or 45 minutes that we spent on that, Um, so I can't make all of the additional statements that I did at that point in time, so I'll say this is not a comprehensive teaching on vows, but the essence of the teaching is that we ought to be serious when we say we're going to do something, especially when we say it to the Lord. We ought to be serious at all times, but especially when we say it to the Lord. God cares about the things we say. Our words matter to him. It matters to him that we're faithful to actually do what we commit ourselves to do. To do otherwise, in fact, is to take the Lord's name in vain. It's the very definition of what it is to take God's name in vain. It is to say, God, I vow this to you. I swear this to you. And then to recant on that is to say, the name by which I swore is really not all that significant because I can break my promise that I made in that name. And so when we fail to see the glory of God, his greatness, when we fail to fear him, then we're prone to take lightly a vow that we make, commitment that we make to him. And so Solomon would say to us, remember who it is you're speaking to when you commit to obey. Be careful what you commit to do in the name of the Lord and do what you say you're going to do. That would be the the application. Now, it's interesting, if you follow the the flow of thought from verse 1 to verse 6 so far, uh, basically it's gone from preparing your heart for worship to participating in worship and then putting into practice what you say you're going to do while you're at worship. Uh, In our approach to God, we ought to have reverence and fear. In the act of worship, we ought to have reverence and fear. And then in the follow-up, the actually putting into practice of what we've said we'll do, we ought to have the fear of the Lord. It should characterize our worship from beginning to end, from the moment we prepare to the moment we follow through and actually do what God has commanded us to do, we ought to fear the Lord. And that's the solution Solomon gives in verse 7, for in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness or vanity or vapor, rather fear God. At this point, if we have accurately evaluated our hearts in any measure, then we recognize nobody in this room has worshipped God the way that we're commanded to in these seven verses. Nobody in this room has feared God the way that this says we ought to. We have taken his name lightly. We have blasphemed him in the way that we've lived and the things that we've said. We've made commitments that we haven't followed through with. We've been insincere in our worship. We've said things with our mouths that we really don't mean with our hearts. All of us have fallen short of the kind of worship Solomon commands of us in these verses, the Lord commands of us in these verses through Solomon. All of us have failed, which drives us to the one who didn't fail. Jesus is the only one who has ever lived who has worshipped God perfectly in the fear of the Lord. In the book of Isaiah, in one of the servant songs, pointing forward to the one who would come and would be anointed by the Spirit, speaking of the Messiah, it says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, that is Jesus, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Jesus lived from his birth to his death perfectly in the fear of his Father in a humble, sincere love and adoration for his Father. Not only did he perfectly fear the Lord, but he perfectly listened to the Lord. Remember, we're told we should come near to listen. Jesus, it's said of him in Isaiah, 
chapter 50, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not disobedient. Jesus is the perfect listener. Not only is he the perfect God-fearer, not only is he the perfect listener, but Jesus is also the perfect speaker. He never speaks carelessly or thoughtlessly. He says in John 12, I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Jesus never spoke a careless word. He always spoke what he meant. And when he said it, it was exactly what was pleasing to his Father. He's the perfect fearer. He's the perfect listener. He's the perfect speaker. And he's also perfectly faithful in his commitments. If you were here Sunday morning for the Sunday school class on covenant theology, we talked about a covenant that was made in eternity, outside of time. A covenant that took place between the Father and the Son. And the Father promised certain things to the Son, and the Son promised certain things to the Father for the accomplishment of our redemption, our salvation. In eternity, knowing that we would be a wrecked world because of our sin, a wrecked humanity, the Father covenanted with the Son, the Son covenanted with the Father for the purpose of accomplishing our redemption. The Son promised to his Father that he would take on human flesh. Behold, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll to do, I delight to do your will, the Son says to his Father. I delight to do my Father's will. He spoke that in eternity. Father, I will go into this this world. I will take on human flesh. I will obey your commandments even to the point of death, even death on a cruel cross for the sake of the accomplishment of the redemption of your fallen people. And he was faithful. He took on human flesh. He lived a perfectly sinless life and he suffered the cruel and shameful death on the cross for us. He was faithful to his vow. We've been Poor fearers, we have been poor listeners, we have been poor speakers, we have been unfaithful in our commitments, and it drives us to Christ, who is perfectly faithful in all of his worship. And it's because of that, because of the faithfulness of Jesus, that even when we recognize the inadequacy of our own worship, we don't have to stay far away, but we can draw near. Even in the acknowledgement of our shortcoming, we can draw near and we can acknowledge that, yes, my worship remains still today imperfect. It's not flawless. It's not everything that Solomon commands it to be here. But I'm told in 1 Peter chapter 2 that when I offer my worship to God through the Son, based on His merits, based on faith in what Jesus has done for me, I am promised that God accepts it and takes delight in it. Sam Waldron has helpfully said, God graciously and kindly responds to our efforts to please him, despite all their defects, because he looks upon us in Christ. We ought to strive to obey the commands of Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7. We should take seriously what it means to worship the Creator We are his creatures. He is creator. We ought to enter into his presence with fear and with trembling, with confidence. We're told repeatedly in the book of Hebrews we can draw near with confidence, but confidence does not mean carelessness. There is a careful, thoughtful approach to the throne of God required of those who are in Christ. And we do that especially by remembering we come by the blood of the Son. A thoughtful approach to God at the most foundational level is the acknowledgement that the only way I have access to a God like this is because this God, who is completely other, became like us and took on human flesh to bleed for me and to die for me, and he's risen now for me. And the only hope that I have of drawing into the presence of this holy other God is the blood and the merits of the God who took on flesh. And so, yes... I'm not, no, I'm not saying disregard Solomon's teaching because it doesn't matter because Jesus paid it all. That's not the application. Take seriously what Solomon has said. Strive to be pleasing to your father in the way that your heart approaches him. But remember that your ultimate hope and confidence before the throne of God is not even the purity of your own worship as a believer, but it is the purity of the worship of the one who gave his life 
for you, who loved you even to the point of death. And so we can say, fear God, and do that especially by remembering what Jesus has done for you, that you might worship God. So let's remember that uh, as we prepare for worship this coming Lord's Day, as we come together and prepare our hearts for worship. Remember, there are three steps in this process. As we prepare to come, we think about what we're doing. While we're here, we participate with a thoughtful, humble heart. As we leave, we put into practice the things that we've committed ourselves to do based on the Word of God, and we do it all in the humble fear of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that though we have fallen infinitely far short of the standard that you require of worship, we have not loved you, we've not worshipped you, we've not served you the way that you deserve as our Creator and our Redeemer. We've loved ourselves too much, we've worshipped you too little, we acknowledge that, God, we confess that even with grief in our hearts, and yet at the same time we rejoice that you have not closed the way to your throne because of our sin, but you have opened it through the flesh of your Son. And so, Father, we pray that you would both create in our hearts a fear of you and a confidence to come near to you. We pray that you would teach us to draw near boldly and yet carefully, that we would honor you in the way that we approach you in worship. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he lives these moments and forever to be our great high priest, the one who intercedes for us. We have no hope other than him, and we pray in his name. Amen.